Hey guys, Kayla Iacovino here, a volcanologist from Expedition Volcano. I am currently a researcher at NASA Johnson Space Center for Jacobs Technology in Houston, Texas. And Chris asked me if I could answer some of the questions that you guys have sent him after watching Expedition Volcano. So first of all, thanks for watching the film. Really glad that you enjoyed it. It was uh, really an honor to be a part of it. So, all right, I have the questions here. Let's just go through them one by one. When testing the rock, you saw that levels of silica was probably lower than the levels found during the 2002 eruption. How much do these levels of silica vary? Can they increase significantly creating more viscous lava or will they always stay within certain levels? So that's a really good question because as the question asker mentioned, the amount of silica in a rock um, very much controls the way that the lava acts when it hits the surface. So more silica means that the lava will be more viscous, more thick, uh, it will be more explosive, it will be slower moving. And the silica in the rocks at Nyargongo and Nyamulagira are really, really low in silica characteristically. And so they can be really, really runny and that po poses certain risks. So it's hard to say really whether or not these levels can change significantly. Um, certainly they can vary you know, with, within a few percent, that's totally expected, totally normal at any volcano. But really what's controlling these levels of silica is how much time the lava, the magma, has to sit in the crust before it erupts. The longer it can sit in the crust and the more interaction it has with the earth that it's moving through, the more silica it can accumulate. So we typically think of silica as a marker of how evolved a magma is. The longer it takes to get to the surface and the more interaction it has with things along the way, typically the more silica it has. So if something major changes uh, underneath Nyiragongo, if something about the structure changes, if uh, the magma cha chamber changes, if there's a new magma chamber, that can certainly lead to a situation where you'd have a more silica-rich magma coming to the surface. That said, I think that's probably unlikely. Um, this is a very, very long-lived consistent, persistent system. And so I would be very surprised to see that kind of a shift. That would be something that scientists would be really excited to learn more about because it's not something we typically see in a volcano like this. Um, next question, are the areas of land producing the carbon dioxide found commonly in volcanic landscapes or are these quite rare? Um, great question. They're relatively common, I would say. It depends very much on not only the topography in the area, so you need regions where CO2 gas can pool and pond, like we have in uh, near Goma, um, but it also depends on the source of the volcanic activity. So remember in the program, we talk a lot about these not being discrete individual volcanoes necessarily, but really more part of an interconnected system. So these volcanoes are just the surface expressions of a vast underground system that goes all the way down to the Earth's mantle, which is the layer beneath the crust. And the mantle beneath Nyargongo and in other regions where you have rifting, where you have two, two continental plates pulling apart, um, what you typically have is a very, very thinned crust. So we have this crust layer right, riding on top of the mantle. And if you pull the plates apart, you imagine like pulling apart dough or putty, it's gonna thin where you're pulling at it. And that's what's happening at Nyargongo, Nyamulagira, is you have this thin crust. And so the mantle material, which is sitting there hot and holding on to all of this carbon, um, it's, it's closer to the surface now because there's a thinner layer above it holding it all in. And so when that happens, you allow the carbon that's stored in that mantle to degas. So not only are you creating areas of melting where you can create magma bodies and, and cause volcanic eruptions at volcanoes, you're also sort of just releasing the pressure on that whole region of mantle. And so it can be releasing CO2 gas and other gases just sort of streaming through the ground. So that's what we saw um, in Goma, is not only the, the gases coming out at the volcanoes, but really in the whole region. And this is something that's quite common in rift zones, like I said, so this phenomenon of allowing that stored gas to be released. You get it be, be released in big, big areas because this rifting process is a really big regional process. Um, next question. Do you know which of the two volcanoes, Nyargongo and Nyamulagira, is older? 
And is there a way to tell how much longer they will be active for? Great questions. These are all like really big questions that we think a lot about um, as scientists and the things that drive us. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, uh, we don't know necessarily which came first, Nyamuligera and Nyirogongo. They're approximately the same age. They probably formed during the same period where there was an initial period of rifting in the area and then that volcanic activity began to start. And again, this is that big regional process. So you're, all these things are very, very interconnected. Um, like I said, as far as I'm aware, perhaps there's other research out there that someone can point me to, but as far as I'm aware, we haven't pinpoint, pointed the exact age of first coming of either of the volcanoes separately, um, but we know roughly that they're about the same age. Is there a way to tell how much longer they will be active for? The short answer is no. Um, that's one of the things that we have a very poor understanding of in volcano science is the longevity of a volcanic system and what is actually driving, what is the most fundamental driver of the volcanism. So is it, as I said, is it this mantle material that's, that's um, coming close to the surface because of the thin crust? That's certainly driving the activity here. Um, but are there other controls? So does it have to do with what material the crust is made out of? Are there extra heat sources even beneath that upper part of the mantle? You know, are there heat sources from deep, deep within the mantle that are feeding this? And could those change? Um, it's this huge system. And because when you're asking questions like, how long will this volcano be active? You really have to, to answer that question, you have to understand something about globally how material is moving with the earth, how heat is moving with the earth. So, you know, something, uh, thousands and thousands of miles away, uh, you know, on the surface, but very, very deep down could actually be affecting what's happening in the, the Kivu area in the Goma region. So um, it's kind of impossible to say. Um, that said, there's no signs now that it's stopping. It will probably, as far as we know, the biggest driver, at least in terms of what we see at the surface, is again, that rifting mechanism um, and that uh, uh, that mag the mantle material coming closer to the surface, and that's still a in process. So as long as that rifting is happening, as far as we know, the volcanism will continue. And again, as far as we know, there's no signs that that rifting is stopping. So we expect it to continue. Certainly, I would I would I would bet money on the uh, volcano continuing to be active for my entire lifetime, but probably many many more lifetimes beyond that. Mount Nyiragongo is described as a stratovolcano, and yet it's characterized by fast-flowing basaltic lava, which we're told at A-level is associated with shield volcanoes. Why is this? This is my favorite question because it's the hardest one for me to answer. It's a really, really good question, and it's one of the things I thought of when, um, when I first went to the volcano when we were filming this documentary. Um, in fact, I had the exact same thought. You know, that's it is a very basic, classic, you know, understanding, the A-levels level understanding, but it's pretty true, you know, it's, it's a pretty universal truth that, that um, stratovolcanoes are made from, from more higher silica lavas that are, um, that are more viscous, that kind of tend to form these steep slopes, and the runny lavas like Hawaii form these shield things, just because of the way the lava moves. And we know that the lava moves in a more runny Hawaii-style way at Nirigongo. So in fact, I, I said this exact thing to some of my colleagues when we were um, on the Crater Rim. And the discussion we had was pretty much, we don't know why this is the case. We had some ideas, you know, maybe it has to do with, um, with the history of the volcano and how the types of lavas and the types of eruptions that have occurred have changed over time. So one thing that we don't, have for Nyiragongo, for most volcanoes in the world, is a very, very good record through time of every eruption. Um, and so for some reasons, um, that's because we just don't, we haven't gotten that yet. We don't have access to that. We don't have enough research that's been done. And for, um, in other ways, that's because some of the eruptions maybe are no longer in the rock record. They've been covered up by subsequent processes. So the earliest eruptions in the history of the volcano are the hardest to access in the field because they're deep down underneath, you know, you have this massive volcano sitting on top of all the rock that then that those rocks are the ones telling the story of the early volcano. 
So it might be that the, the eruptive mechanism, the types of lavas that were coming out, uh, maybe, there were the, maybe the amount of crystals in the earlier erupted lavas was very, very high. So even though the magma itself was runny, if you, if you chuck a bunch of crystals in there, it makes the whole th as a, the thing as a whole, it makes it stickier and more viscous. Um, so there's a number of reasons that could have happened. You know, maybe there were a lot of smaller eruptions that were concentrated near the flanks that allowed it to build up or spatter type eruptions where you're kind of flinging material and dropping it back down very close to the vent. Um, so again, it's like, it's part of the mystery of this volcano. What we need is to go and drill into the side of it and get, you know, see the stratigraphy, stay, see all the layers stacked up on top of each other and really, really understand um, the early history of the volcano to answer that question. It's a very astute one. Okay, the last question. Since the documentary was recorded, has any of the new technology used to try and predict eruptions, such as infrasound measuring, been more successful than other previous technologies used? Um, I'll say that we're constantly improving and growing our ability to measure volcanoes. And there haven't been, there hasn't been a major breakthrough, right, since the documentary was filmed. Um, but all of those things to have had really small steps forward. So infrasound, um, gas measurements, um, seismic, uh, gamma rays is another thing that we didn't talk about in the documentary, but is another way that volcanoes are sometimes monitored. Um, satellite remote sensing, all of these things have made small steps forward. And what I think, not only, not only do we need better technology or better implementation of the technology, we're getting to a point now where we have tons of technology, right? The, the world is becoming more and more computer, computer literate every day. Big data is a thing now, even in geoscience, we, we've been one of the you know, later um, fields to sort of latch onto this big data idea because it takes a long time to collect geologic data. But now we have these instruments like infrasound, you could throw out a whole, array of infrasound instruments or um, seismometers across the globe and collect all of that data. And so what we're doing now in the field is really building up the tools to interpret the data that we're getting. So we're reaching that tipping point, I think, in the field where we've you know have come up to maximum efficiency of collecting the data and maximum technologies to allow us to, to look into the volcanoes. But what we need then are ways to deal with all that data and ways to interpret the data when we don't know that much about a volcanic system. We need to go to, so say a brand new volcano just shows up, we've never seen it before. We wanna go there, we don't know what, how it's erupted in the past. We don't know the temperature, we don't know how deep the magma chamber is, we don't know the chemistry of the lavas, but we put an infrasound, we put you know a bunch of infrasound instruments there and we take measurements. What we need is some way to say, um, something substantial about the volcanic system, predict when it's going to erupt, understand what its current state is based on very, very few data. So we're gonna walk up to a volcano that we've never seen before, take one measurement or take one, even take 10,000 measurements of one kind and have that say something. So really I think the strides we're gonna see in the next 10 to 20 years are not only increases in the technology, but more importantly, I think increases in our ability to utilize those technologies to say something important about volcanoes, because that's really where we're getting to. And it's a really exciting time in the field. So that is all for me. Um, Chris has answered your other questions. So thank you so much for asking these questions and for you know being a part of this adventure in the DR Congo. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you all, and uh, I'm really glad that you enjoyed the program.